Is it <laughs> somewhere fancy? A variety of cigar lounges. And um, during the pandemic, uh, on my back patio, um, uh, as much as possible, through the cold. Um, nice. it, would, it would drop down into the 30s, and I'd be out there with a, a solo stove. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but like yeah, uh, mobile fire pit. <laughs> So you really needed to get out of the kids. You needed the kids and in and in, in, in your family out of your hair. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I wouldn't put it in quite those terms since this is being recorded, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did so much of the writing at these two coffee shops near me, Alon's and Crema. And they're both these Israeli owned coffee shops up in Dunwoody that um, I still need to go by and give them a free book. I, I credit them in the acknowledgements because, you know, I don't think they knew it. I mean, they, they didn't know it, but I'd be there in Crema for you know, a couple hours on a Saturday or something um, in, tucked in the corner. I'd order food, of course. I'd kind of hang out, but I would just, I was a constant presence. And now that the book is done, I need to go by and like give them a free edition and say thank you and, and highlight where I, where, where I acknowledge them. Maybe they, maybe they can leave a couple copies out for, uh, you know, for coffee drinkers to read. Oh, yeah. That's a good idea. Except someone might steal it. Um, Alon's is this big, huge, you know, open coffee place slash market and creme is much smaller but um there's a surprising number of israelis in 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 this suburb that i live in atlanta and uh that is where that is where uh, a lot of the israelis hang out so israeli coffee is the secret to to writing exactly juice it up (laughs) well i hate to interrupt this but if if you guys are ready i'll go ahead and give my my brief welcome and then i'll disappear and you guys can pick it right back up where you you left off. Hello, I'm Chelsea Lake. I'm a member of the events team at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you to PMP Live. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. At any point during the event, you can click on the link I'll be dropping in the chat to purchase Flipped, How Georgia Turned Purple and Broke the Monopoly on Republican Power. You can ask a question by clicking on the Q&A. The Q&A can be found along the bottom of your screen. You just pop it open and type in a question. We'll try to get to everyone's questions, but I apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. We are delighted to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To access captions, simply click on the live transcripts option, which is also along the bottom of your screen. And now onto our event. Flipped is the definitive account of how the election of Reverend Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff transformed Georgia from one of the staunchest Republican strongholds to the nation's most watched battleground state and ground zero for the disinformation wars certain to plague statewide and national elections in the future. Greg Bluestein charts how progressive activists and organizers worked to mobilize hundreds of thousands of new voters and how Joe Biden's victory in Georgia may shape Democratic strategy for years to come. He also chronicles how Georgia's Republicans countered with a move to the far right that culminated in state leaders defying Donald Trump's demands to overturn his defeat. Bluestein tells the story of all the key figures in this election, including Stacey Abrams, Brian Kemp, David Perdue, John Ossoff, Raphael Warnock, Kelly Loeffler, through hundreds of interviews with the people closest to the election. Atlanta Journal-Constitution reporter Greg Bluestein charts how progressive activists and organizers work to mobilize all those thousands of new voters and how Biden's victory in Georgia may shape Democratic victory for years to come. Um, I apologize. I have flipped my computer has flipped to a different page flipped is a good word for this greg uh, (laughs) um and i think i have lost your your bio don't uh, worry you're set (laughs) but i apologize for that but uh greg will be in conversation with jonathan allen he is a senior national political reporter for nbc news Um, he is based in washington dc and he is the best-selling co-author of three books hrc shattered and lucky. Gentlemen, I will turn the screen over to you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. And uh, thanks to Politics and Prose uh, for my money, the best bookstore in America, my, uh, <laughs> my home bookstore here in, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, Greg, let me finish a little bit of your bio, um, because most recently, and I, I saw you on Saturday, 
Um, and uh, for anybody who doesn't know, Greg is the crack political reporter for the Atlanta Journal Constitution um, and uh, an award winning reporter. And he writes the morning jolt, which uh, if you're interested in Georgia politics at all, and you should be, um, the, the morning jolt gets you like, or is it just the jolt? Gets you kind of going with all the tidbits. It's the jolt, yeah. The jolt. Sorry, I think of it as morning jolt because I because it comes out in the TV. mornings. We have morning Joe. Yeah, yeah, it comes out in the mornings. Um, I have this book here. This is the free one that I got. Um, with the the advanced reader copy, but I assure you that there's also one on my phone and a hardcover upstairs. Um, I think the first thing I want to ask you is is about um, and if you open this book, you start with sort of a fascinating behind the scenes um, kind of tale of like hard raw politics between uh, between um, a couple of the politicians that we, we're all going to become even more familiar with uh, over the coming months in terms of uh, uh, Kemp and Purdue. But um, the thing rolls through so easily with all these like sort of insider details. What made you think while you were, were watching all this unfold? Uh, hey, I got to write a book. Yeah, well, Jonathan, you were a part of it. So thank you again. And I'll tell you why. Um, but I really did not go into the cycle thinking I was writing a book. Um, uh, I went into it trying to survive. <laughs> it was the confluence of three of the biggest stories of our lifetime between the pandemic, which I was on the front lines of covering from you know, the government perspective of what the governor Kemp was, um, was doing each day, how the state was responding, all sorts of investigative stories and, 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 and analysis and breaking news stories about the pandemic. Um, add to that the, the protests for social justice that swept Georgia and the rest of the nation. And then of course this epic election cycle. So I went into it just trying to get by, you know, all those things. But around um, late November, uh, a very enterprising agent called me, Justin Brockert, and um, uh, encouraged me to write a book. And I said, uh, I'm just now trying to cover these runoffs. What are you talking about? He said, no, no, no. I really think you should, you should think about it and you will regret it if you don't. Uh, and and you're, you're poised to do it like no one else. Because I had, you know, not only had I been there every step of the way of the 2020 elections, but I had covered some of these characters since, you know, since college. I've covered Governor Brian Kemp since he was a state Senate candidate in 2002. And I was a student at UGA writing for the Red and Black, the independent daily newspaper there. I've covered Stacey Abrams for more than a decade. And, and you know, David Perdue since 2013. And John Ossoff since he called me in 2017 and said, hey, I'm thinking about running for Congress and I've got the endorsements of Hank Johnson and John Lewis. And I said, wow, you might have a shot here. Um, so, uh, and then after that, other than talking to my wife, my, one of my first calls was to you to say like, am I crazy if I think I'm gonna do this? And you kind of said, yeah, but you should, was, was my, uh, my summary of your answer. And I'm glad you were A, honest and B, encouraging because um, it would have been really hard to do. If you had just said, it's you know, don't, it's, it's, it's so daunting. Don't even think about it. I, I might not have, but you said it's daunting. It's going to be hard, but do it. And uh, fast forward all these months later. And, and, and I did. And now you have this incredible book that you can hold in your hands, put on your shelf, hand to your children, um, you know, that your friends can brag about, that your parents can brag about. Um, and, you know, I'll brag a little bit more about, um, <laughs> I'm going to keep doing that throughout. Um, I think, one of the questions that kind of raced through my head as I'm reading this is, and I always try to figure out like, what is it an author's thinking? What are they dealing with? You've got all of these storylines that we're all kind of familiar with at the national level now. Um, it is five years today, I learned from your book, five years ago today that Brian Kemp uh, decided that he was going to run for governor, um, April, April Fool's Day, 2017. You're watching all these threads. How do you how do you think about telling the story of Brian Kemp and David Perdue and John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock and, uh, and uh, Brian Kemp and Donald Trump and Joe Biden and Eva Longoria and some of the other characters that make their way into the book? How do you, how did you sit down and say like, this is how I need to tell this? Is it, was it, this has to be purely chronological. I need to, or I need to break chapters off in ways that are thematic. What was your, what was your approach to it? Yeah, it was a challenge because, as you mentioned, it's not, you know, a, a traditional campaign story of A versus B, right? Republican versus Democrat, where you can just kind of break it off into those subsections. Um, you have eight main characters, right? Stacey Abrams, Brian Kemp, Kelly Leffler, David Perdue, John Ossoff, Raphael Warnock, Trump and Biden. 
Um, and then you've got all these supporting characters too, like Doug Collins, Lucy McBath, and Nikema Williams, who are now themselves, you know, because of the 2020 cycle, they're so well known. Brad Raffensberger, Jeff Duncan. Um, and, and by the way, you know, I mean, Brad Raffensberger, not that long ago, could, could have ridden the Marta, you know, ridden the subway and not be noticed. And um, even by like people who pay attention to politics. And now he's such a big time, well-known name and, and national figure. So things have changed so dramatically for, for all these uh, candidates and these people. Um, and I just had a sort of, uh, the first thing I did was um, section it off into three different uh, sections. Uh, one dealing with the run up to 2018 and that election, because you can't tell the story of what happened in 2020 without telling the story of the election between Kemp and Abrams, Stacey Abrams. Um, and then the next section had to deal with the pandemic, the social justice movement, and everything that happened between Abrams losing and, um, and Lucy McBath winning that her congressional race and uh, the November 2020 election. And then the third section probably could have been a book in itself, but that was the entire runoff. Um, and there really was. I mean, for a little while, I was thinking, why don't I just write this as the book and then do flashbacks? Um, but working with my editor and working with the with my agent and the, and the team over at Penguin Random House, we decided to do the three sections. Um, that was the part of my proposal and that's what they liked. Um, and it gives, you know, for the political junkies who already know their names, it gives a lot of insight, but we also have to remember, of course, there's a lot of people um, even in Georgia who don't know much about Stacey Abrams or Brian Kemp beyond what they see on TV. So we needed to give them a, uh, a good grounding of who those people are. And, you know, again, you know, sort of a, I'm, you know, at the AJC, of course, us reporters, we talk to Republicans and Democrats. And so um, this has a, I hope, a nuanced view of how Republicans are acting, how Democrats are acting, their backstories, their motivations, um, the pressures on them uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a pretty unsparing way. Well, I think every page uh, you go through this as you're reading it, you say to yourself, man, everybody talked to this guy. Right. Like you named you name the eight main characters. And I'm, of course, not going to ask you who your sources are. But one of the things that's striking about it is really that ability to get inside the thinking and the planning and the strategy um, and the relationships between all of these players with compassion for each of them. Well, sort of, you know, so much in our in our uh, media ecosystem these days and in our uh, in books we read and the movies we see. Um, tell what, like one side of a story. But really, and that's kind of what I was getting at with the different threads that you're able to weave together is you really got everybody to talk or people close to everybody to talk in this book. And I think that's, um, you know, really an accomplishment for the reader. It's like stuff just kind of exploding off the page at you. Like, wow, that's really cool. I didn't know that's how politics worked. You know, I mean, I was reading it thinking like, man, I didn't know that's, you know, that's how that thing worked or how that, that piece went down, or this is the relationship between Purdue and Kemp. Um, this is a book that's going to be, uh, I think, important for anybody who is interested in the midterm elections in 2022, um, anybody who's interested in the presidential election in 2024, anybody who's interested in um, how one party can, uh, over time, change the, the nature of a state you know, through demographic changes and registration and mobilization. Um, what do you think, when you look at it, what do you take away and say, hey, this is what people who read this book are going to see about 2022 um, from the 2020, uh, I guess the 2021 runoffs, the 2020 election and the 2018 election. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for all those kind of words. You know, you make me blush. Um, but, um, you know, first off, the, the characters, the people in this book are still right in the middle of everything. Right. Um, nothing's really changed, which I could never have expected. I, I mean, you know, I, I was when I was writing this book, I interview a few people who were close and they went on the record who were close to David Perdue and said some not so nice things about him, even though um, they have longstanding relationships. And uh, it was before he decided to run for governor. And even, even when I went back to the fact checks, I called someone and I said, you're, you're sure you want this in the book, right? And they said, yeah, I said it. Um, but even then, you know, I, I, I thought he was much more likely after the election to run for Senate again and not running for governor. So uh, now we're in the middle of a heated primary battle between Governor Kemp and David Perdue, two longtime allies who were not just allies, they were so close. Um, they were, you know, David Perdue gave Kemp a significant boost all through 2018. Um, the two were kind of tied at the hip at parts of 2018 cycle. Um, so that's one takeaway is that um, nothing is, in a sense, nothing's changed in Georgia politics. All these players 
are still right in the middle of the thick of things and, um, and will continue to do so. Uh, and trust me, you know, I mean, Stacey Abrams has made no bones about it. Um, she has higher ambitions beyond the Georgia governor's race if things work out for her. Um, and maybe even if they don't, because you never count Stacey Abrams out. Um, and Raphael Warnock, John Ossoff, they too have um, higher ambitions. I won't be surprised to see them in the thick of things um, nationally in the 2030s. Uh, and then on the Republican side, you know, Kelly Loeffler, um, David Perdue, you know, no matter how things work out, worked out for them in 2021, um, we already know David Perdue's back on the scene, but Kelly Loeffler is almost assured to run for something again. So it's fascinating um, telling those stories, knowing that they're still continuing. Uh, another big takeaway is while demographics isn't destiny, it sure helps, but you had to have Democrats with very strong messages who really in Georgia um, pivoted their message for the first time we've seen in, in recent history in 2018, um, away from being Republican lights, away from sort of a middle of the road moderate message towards an authentic liberal message that tried to connect with disconnected voters, uh, voters who felt alienated, many of them who were people of color and, and younger voters who just didn't feel like there was a reason for them to vote midterms. Um, Stacey Abrams and, and her allies felt like they gave them a chance. They gave them a reason to go vote. And you saw, you know, that was the, the reason I kind of led the book with, with 2018 was because yes, Democrats didn't win, but they came within a point and a half of, of flipping the state. And that was the major wake up call. Republicans weren't sitting on their hands. They weren't sleeping through it, but that was the big, holy crap moment for Republicans who knew that that was the lead into how wild 2020 was going to be. I remember the election results, uh, you know, looking at those election results in 2018 and seeing that Stacey Abrams in an off year got 100,000 more votes than Hillary Clinton did in the presidential campaign in 2016 in Georgia. That doesn't happen, right? Like, I mean, you know, our, our experience is that, you that uh, you know, both sides will see attrition uh, between a, a presidential year and a midterm year. And, and what you saw with Stacey Abrams at 100,000, I thought to myself, you know, all of the talk about Stacey Abrams organizing or whatever, like, for most of us, you, you know, you listen to it and you hear it and, and, you know, maybe an election looks good or better for one party or whatever. You go, okay, well, maybe there's something to that. But that 100,000 vote difference was like, you know, pure evidence. Um, and I kept talking to people about that during 2020 because I, I, I believe Georgia was going to be close in 2020. Um, I think more than uh, more than a lot of people on the Republican side and the Democratic side. And I just thought like, you know, this presidential election is going to be close. I, I, what I wonder um, is in part, like, what do you, is there a single factor that you think is bigger in that, in that change from, you know, hard red to, to, I think purple is probably the best way to describe it at the moment. But what, what do you look at and say, this is the biggest force and what, are, what are some of the other factors where you say that things are going to move in a democratic direction or move back in a Republican direction? Yeah. And I, and I agree. I think it's, I think we're in purple world here in Georgia, um, although there's some Republicans who jokingly and maybe not so jokingly say flipped, you know, we didn't lose. Um, but <laughs> I think, I think first of all, it's the- suburban. That's Senator Purdue, I think. <laughs> um, first, it's the suburban shift. You know, you mentioned 2018 being so close. I talked about it as well. 2016 was my wake up call because let, let me put it, in 2014, Nathan Deal, the incumbent governor, beat Jason Carter, Jimmy Carter's grandson and a state senator by eight points. Two years later, Donald Trump, always expected to win Georgia, didn't even bother campaigning here during the general election cycle, neither did Hillary Clinton, um, but only wins by five points and loses the suburbs of North, Northern Atlanta for the first time since Jimmy Carter's era. Um, they lose both Cobb County, the birthplace of, of the sort of the modern Republican Party in many ways with Newt Gingrich having represented that area, Johnny Isaacson, all these you know, um, name brand Republican elected officials. Um, they lose Cobb and they lose Gwinnett County, which had been a Republican fortress for so long as well. And then 2018, Stacey Abrams comes within a point and a half. Um, so that trend started moving up and it was powered by suburban voters who are not as just like the rest of the country are not this monolithic white group that, you know, we can stereotype it as. It's not. Um, it's very, the suburbs of Atlanta are very diverse. Gwinnett County is one of the most diverse suburban counties in the eastern seaboard. Uh, it's now represented by five people of color on the commission. Um, Cobb County has gotten a lot more uh, increasingly diverse as well. Uh, and so that helped power the fuel, the fuel the change. But look, so did Trump. Um, and certainly we can look back to 2020 uh, to look at factors that Democrats can't count on in 2022. 
And that includes Trump not being on the ballot. That includes no, you know, not the same pandemic type forces that led a record number of people to vote by mail. Um, but it also included, uh, you know, it's an issue that's still plaguing Republicans, but maybe not as much, but well, we'll see. The jury's still out, but misinformation, um, all the misinformation about voting that stymied, that, 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 that challenged Kelly Loeffler and, and David Perdue. I mean, there's a sto story in the book that I'll never forget, which was um, talking to Kelly Loeffler's aides who said that they had a database of thousands of names of Republican voters, thousands, who were dedicated, hardcore Republican voters who had voted for Donald Trump, who had voted for Nathan Deal, who had voted for, for Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue in November, and who weren't going to vote in the runoffs no matter what you did or said. And the name of the database was GOP Not Voting. That said it all to me, that they had a database that said GOP Not Voting, because no matter how much they wanted to try to get them to change their minds, um, the misinformation was so deeply rooted in these voters' minds that they weren't even going to bother. They weren't even going to try um, to, to try to persuade them. Um, and Donald Trump came for several rallies in the final two rallies in the final weeks of the runoff. And each time, and this is well documented because the entire national media recovered it too, but each time, you know, he spent of the 90 minute rally, 87 minutes talking about his own grievances, three minutes talking about the candidates at his first rally, you couldn't even hear the candidates talk. And you know why? The chant, stop the steal, fight for Trump, overwhelmed any words they were trying to get out of their mouth. mouth. It was one of the loudest um, rallies I've ever been to uh, back then in December of, 20, of 2020. Um, and that was kind of my wake up call that, hey, this, th these lies about uh, election fraud, they're not going anywhere. Well, we, you and I were at this uh, rally on Saturday in Commerce, Georgia, and uh, it was not the loudest rally that no. I've ever been to. Um, and you could hear the candidates, including one of them who said something not very nice about you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <Thank> so, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Well, look, not only can we hear the candidates and, and all that, we got internet connection. I'm used to having no Wi-Fi at those areas because at those rallies, because there's so many people. And I, it just kind of hit me later on. I was like, I never had Wi-Fi problems. Um, I even had one of my colleagues, Patricia Murphy, she decided to stay back and help out because we thought there'd be Wi-Fi problems like at every Trump rally. That to me might be the anecdote that I remember the most about that because uh, we're used to tens of thousands of people at Georgia rallies and frankly rallies around the country. Um, when Trump last came to Georgia in September, there was, you know, it's 20,000 plus people there. Um, this rally, still thousands, but not definitely not tens of thousands and a much more... Um, if the word listless is better, I, just a much less enthusiastic crowd than I'm used to. Still lots of cheering and chanting, but the issue that energized them the most by far was election fraud, 2020. And it shows you just how hard it will be for these candidates, uh, these Trump-backed candidates to talk about the issues that are facing voters now, rather than looking back at the rear view mirror. Um, what do you draw from going to the rally in commerce and seeing this like subdued crowd, like not that many people, what does it mean? Yeah, it's hard. Look, it's, you know, you're in the same business as I, it's hard to infer too much from a rap, from a single rally. Um, you know, if the Trump train is, you know, gone as derailed or whatever in Georgia, I do know this. And, and I, I think it's, I hold it to be true is I think Georgia will be the biggest test in the country of Donald Trump's influence. And not just because of the sheer number of candidates he's endorsed, he's endorsed seven candidates now, six statewide and, and one for Congress, um, but also the nature of the candidates he's endorsed, because they're not easy wins, aside from maybe Herschel Walker, who's up and you know, has 70 percent in some of the polls uh, in the GOP Senate primary. Um, but the rest of them are taking on either open seats or they're taking on tough challengers. And, and first and foremost is David Perdue, who is... Um, who, who, who faced that issue I just talked about. I mean, when he went up there in the crowd and he talked about um, splitting Atlanta into two cities and forming a new city of Buckhead, which is a, a very local issue down here, um, there was hardly a stir in the crowd. When he talked about his opposition to a $5 billion electric vehicle plant, there was hardly a stir in the crowd. But when he started talking about holding those accountable for the 2020 election, not only was there a huge applause, but there was literally a cheer saying, lock him up that erupted behind him. In about, about Governor Brian Kemp. And David Perdue cheered it on. He egged it on. He, he applauded it. He smiled. He gave them a thumbs up sign. That to me, if there was any standout moment of, of that rally, it wasn't anything Trump said. 
it was the fact that David Perdue was cheering on basically a crowd calling for his rival to be imprisoned. <laughs> it's hard to make that up. <laughs> Politics have changed so much. <laughs> it really has. Um, speaking of the two of them, uh, Kemp and Purdue, because I think you have such fascinating stuff in the book. Can you tell a little bit of the story of um, these two guys uh, and the, the question of whether, um, you know, the legislature would be called into a special session to try to audit or reverse the 2020 uh, election results? Because you've got this incredible reporting in the book, and I feel like it gives like a little bit of a, um, a flavor to readers of what they're going to get when they when they buy it. Yeah, after the, um, the November election, the, two days later, the, the first Stop the Steal rally was happening in, in Buckhead in a very wealthy neighborhood just north of Atlanta. And for, honestly, for me, that was a pinch me moment because I still hadn't really taken into account of, of how widespread um, uh, Trump's lies about election fraud had really seeped into the base. I knew it was there. I just didn't know it would be almost mainstreamed. And um, at that rally, it was no fringe cast of characters. It was um, the head of the Georgia GOP was right in the middle of that. It was elected officials. It was Congressman Doug Collins who had just come off a, 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 you know, a losing uh, Senate bid against Kelly Leffler. Um, and that's where the calls for a special session really started to, to rise um, with pressure being put on Governor Kemp and other legislative leaders to, to call um, lawmakers back for a special session Either they said to overturn the election results, to investigate the election results, to look into issues. No matter how they phrased it, we all knew what that meant, which was there was going to be a push to invalidate the five million or so votes that were cast in Georgia. And frankly, I was hearing from a lot of lawmakers privately begging, you know, pleading, hoping that they would not be called back for a special session because, um, A, it would distract attention from the, the runoff candidates. But much more importantly, it would have really turned the Capitol into an armed camp demonstrators, counter demonstrators. There was significant um, concerns about violence, about, about you know, a, anything could have happened. And then all the pressure that would have put on these candidate, these, uh, these elected officials who are mostly, you know, virtually unknown <laughs> many times, right? Some of these backbench lawmakers um, don't even get interviewed by their local newspapers, let alone the national media. Um, and amid all that, the governor came out with the speaker of the house and the lieutenant governor pretty quickly and said, um, we're not going to call a special session because that'll lead to endless litigation. Now, as David Perdue and Kelly Leffler kept on getting more pressure from Trump and his allies to, to quote unquote, do more for Trump, to fight for Trump, um, they felt like uh, one of the things they needed to do was press Kemp to call that special session, um, even if maybe they thought it was a bad idea too. And um, I have this scene from the book at uh, the, ba the Brave Stadium at Truist Ballpark, right before a big fundraiser, where Leffler... Kemp, some of their top aides, David Perdue, are all in this back room um, talking this over. And um, David Perdue goes pretty much eye to eye with, with Governor Kemp and says, I want you to call this special session. We need it. We, we need to show, we need it for the Republican Party. We need it to show Donald Trump that we support him. And Kemp says, I'm not going to do it. I'll take the bullets, um, but, but I'm not going to do it. Um, and, and that was part of the pressure he was getting. And he had already announced that several times he wasn't going to do it, but, but now he's He's hearing from, you know, the most vulnerable Republican, two of the most vulnerable Republicans um, right before runoff, you know, to, to do them this favor just to appease Trump. And that got under Trump's skin. Um, that and uh, many other things that Brian Kemp had done over the years, but they started accumulating. And around then is where you heard Trump um, ratchet up the pressure on Kemp. You know, uh, it got to the point where um, even Trump called for Kemp to resign. You know, we, we didn't think it could get much further. And by the end of the runoffs, he was pledging to support an opponent of Governor Kemp. He was pledging to come back to Georgia for a rally to back a, uh, a, uh, a Brian Kemp opponent. And even then, people were saying, nah, he's not going to do that. I just thought in the back of my mind, no, he's going to do it. And we saw that uh, just this past Saturday in Georgia. Do you think that um, Kemp's decision not to call that special session is one of the reasons that he is still afloat, that he's got a lot of support from those legislators you were talking about who didn't want to see a special session and maybe some of the business community too that was not interested in the state becoming uh, becoming a circus? You know, it's fascinating because he, he's the state's first lifelong Republican governor, the, the, um, the two previous Republican governors, uh, both switch parties. And he's not some squishy moderate. You know, this you're not talking about 
Uh, I know Trump likes to call him a rhino, but no one in Georgia is, is calling him a rhino. He has charted out one of the most conservative records uh, in Georgia history, um, including one of the first acts he did when he took office was to sign a sweeping anti-abortion law into place. Uh, of course, it got held up in the courts immediately, but um, that was an issue that his Republican predecessor steered clear from. Um, he's pushed Republican proposals. He's, he's uh, attacked Joe Biden every stance, every chance he could get. Um, he's gone after, of course, Stacey Abrams, but also local Democratic officials. Um, he's vowed crackdowns on illegal immigration. He's about to sign into law a, a, a far-ranging gun expansion. So again, we're talking about uh, a conservative governor, but at the same time, um, and this is what Stacey Abrams' camp worries about a little bit. Same time, compared with David Perdue, he looks moderate. So he looks a lot more appetizing suddenly to some moderate voters, some middle of the road voters here in Georgia, because he's not gone so far as David Perdue, because he hasn't, um, you know, uh, cozied up to Donald Trump, and and he hasn't gone so far as David Perdue, who just the other day said not only did Donald Trump um, uh, win the election, but for the first time David Perdue said he beat John Ossoff, that he was the victim of a rigged election, which of course isn't true. So by contrast, you know, there is a chance that Brian Kemp, um, you know, stands to benefit from this, if he, if he prevails over David Perdue, stands to benefit by, be, by seeming not as far to the right as David Perdue. Stacey Abrams, how much of what she's done in Georgia is exportable to other states um, and to other districts across the country? Because I, I know that there are Democrats across the country who are, who are in states that they think might someday be more uh, competitive. Texas is an example where Democrats, you know, feel like someday the demographics will come in, someday the registration will. How much of it's exportable? That's a tough one because Texas is a good example. North Carolina, we hear about, of course, Arizona is just about as politically divided, closely politically divided as Georgia is. Um, but first, you know, you need a galvanizing figure like Stacey Abrams. Now Georgia has a, a really deep bench of Democrat, Democratic talent. Um, didn't so much, uh, not uh, just a few years ago. Um, and Stacey Abrams, you know, kind of led the charge and knew it was going to be a long, arduous process. I mean, that, that's another point the book makes. This is not some overnight success. Um, it's not a mirror, you know, it's not some miracle that just happened to fall into Democrats' laps. A lot of other factors had helped them, but um, this was painstaking work, not just from Stacey Abrams, of course, but from the network of activists and organizers and volunteers and voters um, who recognized a decade ago that they needed to connect with, with, with voters who were disassociated, who, were dis, who felt disenfranchised, who felt uh, forgotten in, in Georgia politics with new messaging, with new ways to contact them. And of course, um, maybe first and foremost, um, with, with uh, an ability from, a, from a, a candidate like Stacey Abrams, who can reach out to, to minority voters, to black voters in Georgia, um, who are the backbone of the Democratic Party and give them a reason to vote. Um, so. That you need, and, and candidates like Stacey Abrams, I don't need to tell anyone on this call, don't come along every day. You know? um, Republicans and Democrats have, 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 have been you know, marking her out as a singular political force in Georgia for years, even before she became a, a nationally known figure in 2016. One of my biggest um, questions when she ran for governor was not, was not whether or not she'd be a successful candidate or, or, or able to, um, to be the uh, sort of a force of nature. Because um, we all knew, I mean, you know, covering her in the legislature that she'd be this, that she'd this, be this potent force in politics. It was more of, will she be okay with all the crowds and, and, and the, the, um, the audiences and the attention she get? Because she's an introvert. I detail this in the book. She, she you know, she felt, feels uncomfortable being noticed and recognized in grocery stores. And she's had to come to terms with that because um, these days she's a national figure. Um, but not so long ago, she wasn't. And, you know, there'd be press conferences and I'd be the only reporter at her press conference. And she'd joke, yeah, Bluestein, next time we're going to have this at your office. Um, and both of us knew it wouldn't last that way. Like she knew, it, I knew and she knew that she'd become this, you know, soon that she'd be getting all sorts of national and, and even international attention. Um, but uh, at first it was very jarring for her. So um, first and foremost, you need that. You need a, you need a, a figure like that who could, who could lead the party and you need that base of volunteers. You also need a proof point. Um, and, and Democrats in Georgia struggled to find one for a while. Um, you know, Democrats were losing by eight, nine, 10 points in statewide races. And um, they needed a, a reason to believe that, some, that, that this new approach would actually work. 
and not go the, the same route as the conventional approach. And I think in 2016, they got, they got at least a hint of that because um, Trump won the state, but he won it by five points. You started seeing the sub suburbs flip. Um, and uh, you started to see Democrats say, we want, um, we want to be more aggressive. You know, we want to more aggressively embrace um, liberal issues in the era of Donald Trump, the resistance movement and all that. So I think you need that. And of course you need the demographics. I mean, again, demographics isn't destiny, but it sure helps. And uh, in Georgia, you had uh, uh, increasingly younger and more diverse population um, that could kind of back up those changes. I think what's one of the interesting things that came out of 2020 um, was the, uh, you know, in, in Atlanta, I think you saw an increase in African-American participation that wasn't reflected in some of the Northern cities. Um, you know, in Detroit, uh, you basically have the same turnout for, uh, of African-Americans um, for, for Democrats as you had in 2016. Milwaukee was the same. Philadelphia was a slight bump, but nowhere near the 21% increase in overall uh, votes that, um, that you saw Joe Biden get uh, compared to Hillary Clinton. But in Atlanta, it seems that um, African-American voters had that kind of you know, huge increase in, in participation. Um, do you have a sense of, of why that is? I mean, including some of the things obviously you just said, but um, you know, is there anything in particular going on in the African-American community in Atlanta that may make it different than other cities? Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's the candidates, right? Again, um, and Stacey Abrams wasn't on the ballot, but Raphael Warnock was. And he's the first black U.S. senator in Georgia history, um, you know, and and um, John Ossoff played a huge role in this, obviously, as well. And I go into detail in the book, but doing the runoff campaign, he had a direct hand in every TV ad that he made. And they were all targeting African-American voters, every single one of them, um, in some form or fashion. And, you know, he got some pushback. Um, there were there were national uh, Chuck Schumer was nervous about it. There were some national political figures who were saying, uh, "Are you uh, you know are you going too hard on, on the, you know are you forgetting the you know the white voters the just other audiences other electoral block blocks?" And his campaign was closely watching the, those figures and seeing if his if his polling among white voters and liberals and and you know and outside the black demographic was was struggling and it, it, you know it always held steady, but that played a big role in it as well. Um, was, was having this sort of bromance between John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock, um, two people from very different backgrounds, right? John Ossoff, the first Jewish U.S. senator, who's 33 at the time. Um, Raphael Warnock, the first black U.S. senator from Georgia, um, who is in his mid-40s, eh, early 50s. Um, uh, John Ossoff, having gone through the rigors of a nationally watched campaign from 2017, um, that special election that got unbelievable national attention, that did in hindsight, just served as sort of a preview of what we got 2020. And then Raphael Warnock, um, there it is, the bromance is born. Um, <laughs> and Raphael After Warnock, 19. who had never um, who had never run for office before, but had very close relations with Stacey Abrams. And both of them had to go through um, this gauntlet. You know, Raphael Warnock early in his campaign, he'd go to events and more people would show up for like the local mayor who was introducing him than for Raphael Warnock. Um, John Ossoff was at least already pretty much statewide known because of that congressional campaign, but the entire time was faced with questions about why you, why a 33-year-old who just came off a losing campaign? And first and foremost among that questions was from David Perdue, who, um, as a detail in the book, he viewed him, called him a little shit, like just had no respect for him, um, you know, thought that he was this trust fund baby, knew that, knew that he would be a formidable uh, opponent. Like David Perdue was not uh, downplaying John Ossoff as an opponent, but just did not hold him in high regard like he did his previous opponent, Michelle Nunn, who he ran against in, um, in 2014 and, and had very high esteem for her and her family. Um, famous, famous Georgia family. Yes. Uh, but, this is, but this is a new set of Georgia uh, Democrats who are not linked. I mean, you mentioned uh, Jimmy Carter's grandson earlier, uh, Jason Carter, I think. Uh, you mentioned Michelle Nunn, daughter of Sam Nunn, but uh, the, the ones who have won uh, statewide and uh, um, or have competed heavily statewide in recent years or are actually people who've done it without the name, right? Who've kind of had to work their way up in politics, um, which I think is important um, in terms of, in terms of, to your point, that the candidates matter. Um, we're going to take questions in a few minutes. Um, I'm going to start asking questions from the question set. So if, um, if people want to pop those in who haven't already, please do that. Greg, um, one last question from me for you, which is what was your favorite part of reporting the book like what like 
which part of it you're like, man, this is awesome. I'm so glad I get to dig into this in a way that uh, I don't, you know, in the daily, daily pages of the AJC. Yeah, it's a good question because I'm a deadline guy, right? I mean, so are you. We used to, although you've written three books, so maybe not as much anymore. But, <laughs> but, they have deadlines too. They're just different. <laughs> they're just different, right? But I'm used to like minute by minute deadlines. I read, a, I read a daily blog, a daily newsletter, um, you know, uh, uh, constant stories in the AJC. If I have to wait a week for a story to run, I start getting itchy. You know, I start feeling uncomfortable. So um, being able to take a giant step back and uh, recreate these scenes. And a lot of them I lived through, right? I, was, I, was, I had a front row seat to, to so much of it, um, which helped a lot because I was already there. The, when, when word about Johnny Isaacson's retirement um, spread through this, uh, this room because of a story I wrote, um, sped through this government meeting, I was there when Kelly Leffler was literally on stage introducing um, speakers at the sports venue. Um, you know, I, I was there, um, you know, when, <laughs> when, when, Election, Governor Kemp's election night party, um, Stacey Abrams was not yet conceding and Sonny Perdue leans over to me and says, Bluestein, call this damn thing, right? So I had this front row seat, so that was fun. But going back and looking at it with a different eye, right? I can't, um, you, know, I, you know, I can't use those adjectives and verbs a lot, newspaper stories, these step back approach in a, in a you know, 500,000 word newspaper story that I can in a book that's, I don't know, 110,000 words. Um, but also just going back and, and calling all the, these print, all these all these people and their aides and saying like, hey, you know, I know I reported this at the time, but like, what's the why did this happen? Or, or you know, Casey Cagle, what was it like to have someone? He was the lieutenant governor. What was it like to have someone secretly record your conversation and basically end your campaign for governor in twenty in twenty eighteen? You know, those those conversations that weren't always easy to have, but were very illuminating for the book. Um, and, and really like satisfied my own curiosity because it gave me a reason to go back and ask all these questions of these candidates about like, what was going on in your mind when this happened? We've done such a great job of rendering it. I mean, as you know, the, the reader, it's like just so easy to like kind of move through the pages and you get this like rich detail and it's like, you know, you didn't, we didn't have to work for it. You, you did all the work. Um, I'm going to ask you a, a couple of questions that have been uh, popped in here. Um, the first one, actually, this alludes to, uh, of this rally that you and I were at in Congress, Georgia on Saturday. Um, and I'm, I'm reading from the question. Uh, last week in a rally in Georgia with former President Trump, Vernon Jones put a remarkably clever twist on your name, calling you Greg Butstein of the AJC. As someone who shares that last name and your brother here in D.C., how do you respond to that damning insult? And do you plan to bring back honor to our family name? <laughs> wow, that's my brother Max. Thank you, Max. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny because we we were sitting standing next to each other, John, when um, when Vernon did that, and like my first reaction was, and Vernon Jones, by the way, is a former Democratic um, state lawmaker. He was the, the the Democratic chief executive of DeKalb County, which is the most important Democratic county in Georgia. And can um, I stop you for one second, just so people understand this? It wasn't like he walked by and said this to you. The man was standing on stage at a Trump rally, right? And I yeah. mean, this is where, where candidates try to like bring the fury of the crowd on people. You know, Trump's always talking about the media, the points out at the media pen and calls us the dishonest lying media and whatnot. And so Vernon Jones is on the stage and in his few minutes where he gets to appeal for help as a candidate for Congress, he, he slurs you. Um, yeah. and, and there's no react, by the way, no crowd reaction. Yeah, I mean, look, I like they, they support you. Well, they either support me or they don't know who the hell I am, which is either way, it's fine. With well, I'm me. sorry, I, I interrupted you. No, that was, I was going to preface that. So this guy's a former Democrat who, who switched, switched over to the GOP just last year and endorsed Trump two years ago. And by the way, like I, you know, bro, he, he was I, he called me to break both those stories. So it's not like we didn't know. each. I mean, we've known each other well for years. Um, but look, we've been we've 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 reported accurately on his campaigns and. And um, I don't think he's liked our coverage. And not that long ago, we had a story that one of my colleagues wrote about how even after he switched to the Democratic, even after he endorsed Donald Trump, he still voted in the Democratic primary for president. So those aren't things that probably endear him to Donald Trump. So you're right. In the few minutes he had on stage in front of a, th a couple thousand people, um, instead of talking about his campaign, he attacked the AJC and me personally. Max, about whether or not I'll fight for our name's honor, you know, I haven't, I don't know about you, but I haven't heard that, that, that since I was in kindergarten. And usually, 
I'll be honest. Usually I get called, it was butt stain, not butt steam. So it just, it could have been worse. <laughs> but look, what did we do? What did we, we kind of reacted with at first like surprise and then like, okay. Um, I've been called a lot worse. So I'll put it that way. Um, here's, a, here's another question, a little bit less on that uh, track and more on the, the future of Georgia elections. As, yeah. we, as we look toward the uh, 2022 midterms, can you speak to how you expect redistricting to impact state, uh, impact the state in key races such as Lucy McBath and uh, Carolyn Bordeaux uh, and and others. Yeah, well, first off, redistricting it was in- fascinating because um, this is no solace to Democrats, but Republicans could have been a lot more aggressive, and they decided not to. And, and I say that because um, there was a lot of talk that Republicans would draw both the suburban districts that had both flipped blue, that they would draw them both to flip back red. Um, and they could have done it. You know, there, there, there was all sorts of pathways for Republicans to have drawn both Lucy McBath and Carolyn Bordeaux's district um, to both flip blue. Um, but instead, they, they went for one. They went for the safer bet. Um, they drew Lucy McBath's district so conservative that there's no way she could have won uh, another term. It, it, it now stretches all the way to the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, it goes all the way close to the Tennessee border, uh, incorporating a much more conservative territory. Um, so instead, uh, Lucy McBath is now facing Carolyn Bordeaux, who's now in a safely blue district. That, that district was drawn so blue that it's no longer a swing district. Um, so the end result is Georgia doesn't really have any swing districts anymore. The, sec- the Southwest Georgia second district might be more competitive than people, people think, but still it's favoring the incumbent Sanford Bishop. Um, but you know now we have races that will end in May, in the May primaries, or maybe the, the runoffs and not November. Um, and you know, we saw that down the ticket too in the state legislature. Um, Republicans are gonna lose a lot of state legislative seats, especially in the, in the state house um, because Republicans took the long view um, rather than you know, try to flip a number of seats that could go, could swing back later on in the decade. They drew a number of states to be very, very safely Republican at the, at the risk of losing um, more uh, swingish seats uh, near, near Metro Atlanta and the suburbs. So Republicans had sort of the long game in mind rather than immediate gains in 2022 and maybe even 2024. Um, they they drew, drew those maps to maintain control over the delegation and over the state house um, throughout the decade. And that's gonna be a problem obviously for Stacey Abrams if she wins um, because there is no way, you know, unless, unless some uh, shocking political adventures happen, there's no way the Democrats will take the Georgia state house, the Georgia legislature. And so Stacey Abrams knows that she has to work with a Republican controlled legislature to achieve her top priorities, which pretty much can be summed up in two words right now about her focus on the campaign trail, and that's expand Medicaid. Is the, the, and let me just ask you, I mean, I, at some level, that, that concept does not seem to be unpopular in Georgia across the, you know, across the aisle, right? Uh, there is definitely an effort to figure out how to ensure more people. That's one of the things that I came away with leaving last week was that I felt like I heard, you know, all but a handful of candidates talking about expanding health insurance. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, and this is not new in Georgia politics either. Uh, Stacey Abrams uh, highlighted that issue in 2018. But in 2018, she also had to sort of boost her, her liberal credentials too. I mean, she, she talked about expanding Medicaid, but she also talked about decriminalizing marijuana and expanding voting rights, right? And um, uh, also uh, gun control, all sorts of other issues that she still believes in. It's still part of her campaign platform. But right now when she's out on the campaign trail, uh, and I put it in a story today, one of her quotes at a fundraiser was, I can't talk enough about expanding Medicaid. I mean, any question she gets, if she gets asked a question about infrastructure or rural health, or sorry, rural Georgia, or um, economic development, it in, almost invariably, invariably leads back to expanding Medicaid because she believes that it's, it's much more about it's, it's as much as it's about expanding healthcare access to hundreds of thousands of Georgians who are not now insured by Medicaid. Um, it also it will bring new jobs and new investment and, 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 uh, and uh, improve public health overall. Um, turning to another question from uh, a viewer, I didn't realize Abrams was an introvert. What's the key to her success and why haven't other people trying to mobilize like she did had the same success? I mean, you talked a little bit about that last part, but Really, like when you look at her as a as a political figure, and and even though she didn't win the governor's race, she's become a national figure, as you mentioned. What what is the key to to Stacey Abrams? You're trying to understand like 
why is this person such such an important deal? Why were you sitting in a room alone with her at a press conference thinking to yourself, someday there are going to be a lot of people in this room, and I hope she still remembers. <laughs> and by the way, it wasn't long until there was, not that long afterwards, it was just a few months. Um, you know, I was at random little town in North Georgia. Ooh, where were you? I can't remember. Anyway, I was at some random little town, and um, there were three New York Times reporters there. <laughs> and one of them said, we're sending an army this is back in 2018. And I remember going back to my editors. I was like, they were sending an army and it's just me. It's still just me here. Um, not that we don't have other AJC reporters. It's just, we have, uh, we do not have the resources that a giant national outlet like, like the New York times has. Um, uh, but look, I mean, part of it is, is her ability to um, withstand defeats, right? I mean, she was the house minority leader um, at a, at a time of, uh, of tremendous struggles for the state Democratic caucus back when Republicans um, were just hovering around a super majority. Um, you know, after her defeat to Governor Kemp, I was on a helicopter with Governor Kemp going to some event in South Georgia um, uh, about, about the hurricane relief, I think it was. And he marveled her. We were just talking and he, he marveled. He said, you know, somehow she's become more famous than me in her defeat, right? So she's been able to parlay just through like a, part of it's a relentless drive. I mean, just she's had this focus, this vision of her um, political success since she was a teenager. She made this famous spreadsheet that ch charted her, her career trajectory. And back then it was mayor. And she's obviously changed that to governor. But it was mayor. She wanted to be a state lawmaker. She wanted to be mayor. Um, she was going to be uh, in, in statewide office. And then she was going to be president. And, and you know, um, she, she says what a lot of candidates don't, don't like to say. She's very open about um, that trajectory. She's very open about the fact that she wants to she wanted to be vice president. She wanted to be Joe Biden's running mate. Um, she wants to be president one day. Uh, you know, she, she's focused on becoming the Georgia governor, right? But um, she hasn't shied away from talk about, about being ambitious. And in part, that's because she wants to show younger, younger uh, women, especially women of color, that, hey, it's okay to be um, authentic and amb ambitious and talk about your dreams openly. Um, I think that's part of it. And part of it is just the team she's built around her. Lauren Gro Wargo, her, her, her top aide, um, uh, has the same vision. They, they, they kind of, they can't be more different, you know, they're very different people, um, but uh, they both share the same vision and they kind of both speak for each other sometimes. And uh, so she's had Lauren Grow Wargo to be relentless at her side. Um, and, you know, she has, even though she's a TV addict and she loves watching pop culture and Star, we all know that she loves Star Trek because she was just president of Earth in one of the recent episodes. Um, uh, she, she has devoted so much time to different avenues, whether, whether it be writing books or starting businesses or getting involved in the political sphere or fair fight action, that she knows how to keep her name in the game. And certainly in Georgia, I mean, from, from the moment she ended her campaign, there was very little doubt from me and from others who have been covering her so closely that, that we'd be right here talking about her rematch against Governor Kemp in 2022. Um. Given the difficulties that many of Trump's endorsed candidates are having in their primaries, not only in Georgia, but across the country, are you surprised new Republicans other than Gary Black tried to challenge Herschel Walker in the Senate primary, especially given his baggage? And for those who are um, not as familiar with Herschel Walker, he's, uh, there are allegations that I believe an admission at one point of domestic violence, um, a variety of other uh claims that have been made about him and his behavior in the past or some erratic behavior or stand off the police. Um, are you, are you surprised that he didn't draw more of a challenge? Yeah, it's a good question because Herschel Walker came in as this sort of unknown about how he'd handled himself on the campaign trail. He has the history of domestic abuse, uh, allegations of domestic abuse in court cases has been in police reports um, of uh, erratic behavior of confounding remarks of uh, exaggerating his business record, all these things we've reported on. Um, just today, um, uh, CNN expanded on reporting I did about um, him lying about graduating from UGA. He never graduated. He, uh, you know, he, he was drafted to, to play in uh, pro football. Which um, people my age remember. Yeah. I, mean, the moment, <laughs> I remember he came out early. It was a big thing. Yeah. And look, I mean, when I saw that on his back in, I think it was December, I wrote the first story on it. But when I saw that on his campaign website, it was the first thing I thought. I was like, I know he didn't graduate because it was such a big deal that he didn't graduate. The only question I had is, did he go back and, and graduate somehow later on and you know, just not, you know, uh, didn't get public attention? But no, that didn't happen. So anyway, there's all this backstory of his, but also he's 
probably has almost universal name recognition in Georgia. He played football before I was born, but I still grew up hearing tales of his athletic feats, right? I mean, you can't, you can't be a Georgia native and, and have not heard something about Herschel Walker growing up, it seems. Um, and so that was his advantage. But of course, he also came with Donald Trump's support. And Trump sent a message um, very early on that he wanted Herschel Walker to win. And as a, if Walker ran, he'd be, quote unquote, unstoppable. And I remember sitting down with, um, there's another candidate in the race, Latham Sadler. He has a, you know, he's, he's about uh, 39, 40. He has a, uh, he's a former Navy SEAL. He's a former Trump administration official. He's a banking executive. He has all this stuff on his resume. Um, but I sat down with him not long before the race, you know, just to talk over his, his campaign, nothing formal. Uh, he was thinking about running at the time. And it was the same day as, as Trump endorsed Jody Heiss for uh, Secretary of State. And it was the biggest news in Georgia at the time. It was a huge deal. And I just said, that's what you're going against. There's a juggernaut. And back then, Trump's endorsement meant everything. Um, we still aren't sure what Trump's endorsement means in this 2022 cycle. But I can probably tell you that Donald Trump, sorry, that Herschel Walker was the only of the seven candidates up there on stage with him that probably didn't need it. And he, sure, he certainly welcomed it. But Herschel Walker, had he run without Donald Trump's endorsement, would st probably still be the front runner of the GOP just because of that name ID. In, well, in part because of that name ID. Everybody, everybody knows her. Um, the question that we got is, what's your sense of when Republicans might stop the ideolog ideological gymnastics they have to perform to appeal to Trump followers? Well, May 24th, the Georgia primary will be a big indication of that, because if um, if if David Perdue loses, if um, some of the other Trump backed candidates who are, who are long shots, these are, they, you know, Trump backed a lot of candidates for down ticket races where Georgians don't even, not only do they not know who these challengers are because they just got in the race a few days ago, but they barely know who the incumbents are. And so a lot of them are just gonna vote, you know, just like a lot of voters vote for the incumbents. Um, so we'll know then, um, but we also know this holds true too. Brian Kemp, for as much as um, Donald Trump has attacked Brian Kemp and, and, and threatened him and bullied him and intimidated him and cajoled him and pressured him and all that, he still hasn't said a public bad word about Donald Trump. Um, and you're not going to see that change. You know, so, so as much as this election might be a, a rebuke to Donald Trump and his preferred candidates, you're still not going to see a wholesale shift from the Georgia Republican Party away from Trump. There might be some shift away, and it will be looked at as an indication of Trump's clout being you know, waning. But you're still not going to hear Republican candidates who prevailed over Trump-backed um, contenders. You're not going to hear them gloat and, and kind of dance on Trump's grave by any means. Greg uh, and everybody else out there, the book is Flipped, How Georgia Turned Purple and Broke the Monopoly on Republican Power by Greg Bluestein. If In my screen, it shows up backwards. So, uh, I see it forward. So. All right, but that's if good. If it's flipped, it's, it's flipped. It, it helps. It's flipped. Forward. It's supposed to be flipped, right? So um, <laughs> uh, thank you, of course, for, for doing this. But um, also, I should just say that to everybody who's been watching, you can tell that Greg is an encyclopedia of uh, Georgia politics. Um, you will learn so much about politics from this book that is applicable outside of the state of Georgia and applicable outside of the races that he's covering. Um, I, I read it. Uh, it did not take me long to do so um, and enjoyed every page. Thank you. So buy the book. <laughs> buy the book. Yes. Thank you. Um, I put the link to purchase the book in the chat, of course. And I, I want to apologize Greg, for flubbing your bio at the top of the hour. And thank you, Jonathan, for pinch hitting for me. It's one of those things where I just selected and deleted the text. Don't and worry at all. So apologies in advance, but if you really want to support Greg, of course, the best way to do it is the book. The link will take you directly to the politics and prose website. Um, and after you purchase a book, and of course, if you're local, you can purchase online and pick up uh, curbside or in store. But after you purchase a book, I hope you'll visit our events page. Uh, we have a, a number of in-person as well as some virtual still events um, in April. We'd love to see you there. In the meantime, everybody stay well and well read. Thank you, gentlemen, for such a, a wonderfully engaging and fascinating hour. I wish we had more time. I could I could go on listening more. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Buy the Take book. Care.